Hello everybody. <laughs> Hi Mango. You want to sit in my lap? Okay. Hello everybody. Welcome back to Dissociated, a channel that is dedicated to destigmatizing mental health and trauma related illnesses. I'm Kaya and I'm the host of our system and this is Mango. Hi gorgeous. If you don't know what that means, I have dissociative identity disorder and that means that I have multiple personalities that developed in order to help us survive a lifetime of trauma and abuse starting in early childhood. I'm the host and that means that I'm the alter, alternate state of identity that's out to handle daily life most often. If you'd like to learn more about DID and the other alters in our system, please have a look at the other videos on our channel. In this video, I'm gonna share some tips about how you can manage your trauma responses during a triggering discussion. And this was a topic that was actually requested by one of you in our comments. It can be really hard to deal with triggered responses when you are in a conversation that you can't get out of, or when you have a history of abuse or trauma in your past, but don't worry, you're not alone and there are things that you can do to help. What are you doing? It's making it very difficult for me to look at what I need to look at. Oi. The first step is using grounding techniques. This is a great immediate response that you can start to use as soon as you notice that you're starting to get triggered. It will help to curb the response before anything really starts to happen, if you notice it soon enough. They can help you stay connected to the present moment when you're in the middle of a triggering situation or discussion. A great way to ground is by focusing on your senses. You can focus on what you can see, hear, touch and taste. You can also use physical grounding techniques like tapping your feet on the floor, holding or rubbing something that's an interesting feeling or texture like a specific piece of cloth that you might carry around with you that you like, perhaps a zipper. If you have a zipper and you're wearing like a coat or something, a lot of the time we'll be running our hands up and down the feeling of those interlocking pieces of metal because that's quite an interesting sensation. Textures, scents and sounds are what we find to be the most helpful things to focus on. When we start to dissociate because we're getting triggered, we find that our sight is one of the first things to go. A hearing is pretty close by, so it can be difficult when somebody is asking you to ground based on what can you see, because sometimes it's really difficult to see. But if you can ground like that, it's very, very good. Taste we find very helpful and very easy to do. We carry a packet of mints around in our pocket all the time just in case we need to ground. Any strong tastes, refreshing tastes, sharp tastes are going to shock your body back into the present moment. For scent, essential oils, jewelry that helps you carry essential oils, like little pieces of foam you can get to put in jewelry that you can saturate with essential oils. That way you can just subtly lift a bracelet to your nose, for example, like that, as if you're moving your hair out of the way and get a strong smell of that essential oil and that will help you come back. The idea is that grounding makes you feel less overwhelmed and more present. It will help take you away from the traumatized part of your mind and sit you right back where you need to be in the conversation that you're having. You can also generally do this without being noticed. If you would like to watch a video specifically about grounding, we do have some that you can check out and you can watch them either up here or in the description box below. The next step is to communicate. Take a moment to pinpoint what it is that's actually triggering you. It could be the tone of someone else's voice. It could be the volume of their voice. It could be a specific topic. It could be a word or a phrase that's being used, especially if it's being used in the conversation repeatedly. It could even be the energy that the person is giving off, a feeling or an emotion that you're experiencing. It could be the environment, a smell, the temperature. There might be a song playing in the background that you associate with someone or something traumatic from your past or your present. Once you've pinpointed what it is that's causing you to have a reaction, communicate that to the other person if you feel it's safe. At this point, you can tell them what you need right now in order for you to be able to control that trigger response. As an example, let's say that you've identified what's triggering you as being the smell of cigarette smoke. You might want to communicate something like, I can smell cigarette smoke on your jacket and I think that's what's triggering me right now. Then suggest some ways that you can change the situation between you in order to help you. So in this instance, you could ask them to, could you please take your jacket off? Because I think that that's what's holding most of the cigarette smell. And if you took your jacket off, I might not be able to smell it as strongly anymore. If you don't want to ask them to do something, tell them what you're going to do instead. I'm just gonna take a step away from you so that I can't smell the smoke as strongly. You can ask if they have something on them or with them that can help reduce the strength of the trigger. So you might ask them, do you have anything you can spray, an aerosol that can help to disperse the smell faster? Or you might want to leave the environment itself, especially if, like we said earlier, music in the background is triggering you or something. In this case, we're using smoke. You might want to go somewhere that's not an enclosed environment. So you might say, do you mind if we go somewhere where there's fresh air? 
and then let them know what will happen if these needs aren't met. Otherwise, I'm gonna get triggered and it's gonna be very difficult for me to continue this conversation. Don't feel guilty about doing any of this. These are very normal and small things to ask. They're reasonable and normal requests and nothing that you need to feel ashamed or guilty for. Firmly state that if these things don't happen and your needs aren't met, then you can't continue this conversation and you're gonna have to pick it back up with them at another time. You don't necessarily need to put a timeline on it. You can just say at a time when I'm feeling more mentally stable, better able to concentrate and in a safer place where I can give the attention that you deserve to this conversation. Tip three is to stay and set down boundaries. Like I just said in tip two, it is okay to take a break from a conversation or step away from it if it starts to become too triggering for you. You do not have to continue at risk of your safety and discomfort. Just let the other person know that you need a break and you can come back to the discussion later. I know you might want to push through and you might be used to just trying to push through or going into a dissociative state or if you have the idea or OSDD, switching out to be able to handle and deal with the trigger while pushing through whatever you're experiencing it. It is okay to step away. It will help you feel more in control and it will prevent the trauma responses from becoming overwhelming. It's also gonna help train your brain into prioritizing and accepting your needs and safety instead of pushing through your body's warning signs and your own discomfort just to validate somebody else's personal preference. As trauma survivors, a lot of us are people pleasers and that's a really, really important habit to break. Putting yourself at risk or allowing yourself to be pushed into a triggered space just to please or exercise someone else. Tip four is to detach from the emotional state with mindfulness. Wait, just wait. If you're anything like me, you've probably heard the word mindfulness and gone, oh, for God's sake, <laughs> wait. I'm gonna explain to you a version of mindfulness that doesn't feel like that. But before we do that, when you first notice that you're getting triggered, take a moment, focus on your breathing. Get back into your body. Don't let yourself be pulled back into the recesses of your mind or into a trauma memory. You can try breathing techniques. I like the box breathing technique. Counting works too. If you want a video on different breathing techniques or even guided techniques where we go through it with you that you can watch when you're stressed or triggered, we can absolutely do that. Just let us know if that would be interesting to you or helpful. A great time to do this is just after you set those boundaries and requested some space, whether that be a day, a week, a month or longer, for you to get back into a stable place and a responsible and reliable headspace, especially if you know that you're gonna get triggered by that conversation again. So how can you practice mindfulness without getting triggered again. Once your initial response has calmed down, and bear with me with this, please, I promise, it's, it's easier than it sounds once I get into it, try to observe your thoughts and feelings without reacting to them. That is the one thing that when people say that, I'm like, that's stupid, shut up. <laughs> I can't do that, because if I could do that, I wouldn't get triggered, right? But, bear, bear with, trust me, just trust me, <laughs> I promise, I know what I'm talking about. One way to do this that works for us is by naming and identifying the emotion you're feeling. It's really easy, you might have to focus, but just think for a second, just sit with yourself, focus on what you're feeling and name it. I'm feeling this emotion. I'm feeling guilt, I'm feeling fear, I'm feeling resentment, I'm feeling betrayal, I'm feeling anger, I'm feeling nervous, I'm feeling uncomfortable. All those things, those emotions, could end up being triggers in themselves. Hello? Who just got close? Cheeky American accent slid in there. Okay. Triggers. Okay. I have an example of us using this technique in real time from a vlog that we made and never went anywhere back in 2021. 2021? 2021. Why did that sound so weird? So we were recording this, like record a week of your life type thing, personal vlog, and it didn't really go anywhere because it was just really, really depressing. Things were not good for us in 2021, but there is a specific clip. It's mainly Nin and Kyle, but then a lot of other alters come into the front too, and they're trying to stop and deal with a panic attack and prevent that from turning into a flashback and we do do it successfully by using this method. It's about 10 minutes long and we manage to regulate and deal with that just by acknowledging and naming what we're feeling. And also as a DID system, what's going on? Who in your head is where? What alter is where? Whose emotions are whose? 
Are you distressed because you're actually feeling someone else's emotions and you're realizing that you can't control them? Or is it you and your emotions that are distressing you? Because that's a 10 minute video, if you guys are interested in seeing it, we can upload it and talk you through it as a separate video, as an example on how to do this technique. I've tried to explain it just with words in this video, but if that's not enough and you'd like to see it, it might be a little bit distressing for some people. It's very raw, but you, you can see how it works in real time as somebody who was genuinely experiencing a panic attack or about to experience a panic attack and managed to cut that off before it turned into a flashback. If you're still having the discussion that is traumatizing you, traumatizing, I hope it's not actually traumatizing you. So if you're experiencing a conversation that's not traumatizing you, but it might start to make you feel a little bit triggered or maybe just a bit uncomfortable and emotions start coming up really strong. And all you're aware of is that you're getting triggered or you're feeling emotions, but you haven't taken the time to stop and be like, okay, okay, what's actually happening? What am I actually feeling? This can help you to regulate. While you're doing that, it can help you stay calm and focused. You can sometimes, depending on how far gone you are, how easy you find it to do this. I know some people, especially people with autism, have a harder time identifying the emotions that they're feeling and experience. If you are able to do this during a discussion, then you can do it in the background and just keep tabs on how you're feeling and how you're reacting to things. Just so that you know that, you know, if anything gets too far, you know you can stop. It won't always work, but when it does, it not only provides relief from the trauma response that you're experiencing, but can also help identify and pinpoint your responses to trauma and where they're coming from for the future. It will help you learn what to look out for and how to combat those responses before they start to happen. When you get used to this, at some point, it may even become automatic and you'll be able to identify when you're starting to get triggered even sooner than you have been before. I realize I'm using my hand a lot, sorry. Tip number five, use coping strategies. Coping strategies can be, like we mentioned earlier, breathing techniques, square breathing, box breathing, whatever you wanna call it, counting, visualization, progressive muscle relaxation, meditation, whatever works for you. Coping strategies can help you manage your emotions and your responses during the triggering discussion. So again, this is something that you can do while the discussion is happening if you want to. For us, sometimes, you know, tactile grounding stuff can also be a coping strategy. We've had it set as its own thing because it's a big one, a <laughs> big one. We have like little slime things that we find really tactile and helpful. If I'm having a discussion with someone, I'm finding it difficult, you know, you can't see it, I'll be under the desk, you know, touching some slime. Something to bite or chew, a sweet, a mint, can double as being grounding because of the taste. You might have sensory objects, sensory toys, um, like this which we keep here for this purpose. This, hello, this is a sensory toy. So it's got like buttons on it. I think this was a gift from a subscriber a long time ago. It's got little thingies that you can pull. The amount of times I've been in like study or a Zoom call where I'm learning or teaching or whatever. I have to mute myself because I'm <laughs> clicking this, pulling that. Sometimes we bite this, I don't know, it feels satisfying. It's like a joystick, you can move it around. It's got a switch on and off this. It's like a little spiral, you spin it and it feels interesting. And if you use your nail on the side, you can push it. And then these like little wheels here, that's like a interesting texture. I don't know if this is gonna focus or not. Yeah, look at that, yeah. These are fun, push and pull these. I've got like makeup on my hand, ignore that. Um, yeah, this little joystick, fantastic. 500 million little scented tea light candles, which smell really strong, even though these are like three years old. They can all be considered coping strategies in their own right. You can also use distraction techniques like listening to music, obviously, <laughs> well, you could do that while you're in a discussion, actually. If you had like one earpod in and some music play it quietly, obviously not like if you're playing some <laughs> out loud <laughs> where you're trying to have a conversation with someone because they won't be like, what the fuck are you doing? Pay attention to me. But no, music either in the background or afterwards, maybe as a coping mechanism, coping skill, coping technique even, you know, if you want to call it that, coping technique, hello. I need to calm down, man. I don't know what's happened all of a sudden. Somebody must be close. Um, it's probably Mike. This is probably Mike. Um, bro, get your shit together. What am I talking about? Uh, yeah, like, damn, play a game, watch a movie, chill, journal. 
Whatever works for you. You'll find things that work for you. It's different for everyone. Experiment, find out what works for you. My last tip, and I'm sure you're ready for this video to be over. I feel like this is gonna be a long one, is to seek support. Having a support system makes a massive difference when it comes to managing your trauma responses. And this would be seek support after the conversation has ended or while you're leaving it even, or damn, if you're having a text conversation and you don't know how to leave or get out of it, message someone else and be like, this is what's going on. I'm starting to get triggered. What do I do? Can I just have some support that everything's okay? That's okay. You're allowed to do that. You can reach out to friends. You can reach out to family. If you have a good and supportive family, reach out to your therapist. Talk to somebody who understands you, who knows who you are, how you respond, how you feel to things, and makes you feel validated and reassured and secure. You might also want to consider joining some kind of support group for people who've experienced similar traumas to you. There is nothing quite like speaking to somebody who has been where you've been, who really understands it from a first person perspective because you know you can read about it and study it and get as many degrees as you want you don't know what it's like until you've been in that situation and felt those feelings and had those trauma responses yourself it can be game changing especially if you have a less common disorder like DID to speak to somebody who gets it really gets it sharing your experiences and learning from others is a great way to kind of de-stress and come back down from all that stuff too and if you have a therapist, you might wanna make some notes or even a video. So talking to the camera, talking to yourself, you don't have to share it, you can just do voice if you want to. Processing like that really helps us. And if you do want to then share it with your therapist, it will give them great insight into what's going on with you. If you just wanna make a note about it, to talk about it in your next session, that is fine too. You don't have to go above and beyond, stick, above and beyond, who? Above and beyond, but also overboard. Above and beyond, above and beyond and overboard, if you will. Um, just stick with what's comfy for you. Ideally, you'd want to avoid situations that would involve triggering discussions. But sometimes, I know, that's just not possible. Sometimes you have to have triggering discussions or go into situations that are triggering for you and there's just nothing you can do about it. But it is okay. I know this is difficult. And sometimes difficult feels like not a big enough word, a massive understatement, but you can do it. I bet some of you are looking at the screen going, Kaya, I can't do it. You can do it. You can do it. You will be okay. You can do it. Just remember, it's okay to take breaks and set boundaries to protect yourself. That doesn't make you a bad person. That's nothing to feel guilty about. You're not asking for much. A lot of neurotypical people ask for their own little requests like this and we don't even realise it. It could be something from, the music is too loud, let's move away from the bar. Or, it's feeling really stuffy in here, let's go outside to get some air. It's just done in daily life. It feels like a bigger deal to us because trauma is a big deal. But it's nothing unusual to ask for what you need. And people who love you and care about you will want you to ask for what you need. Find the right tools, find the right support. I bet you already have most of what you need and didn't even realize it. I really hope that these tips help you next time that you're in a trigger space or going into a triggering discussion. You can watch it quickly, skip to whatever tip you need to, to get through it and you will get through it. You've got through it every other time, you're gonna get through it this time and the next time and the time after that too. You've got this. Lots of love everybody, bye.